Hello, this is Dr. Hannah Osil, and this is Unit 3, uh, the paper that was on October uh, 2019 in the uh, International AS Chemistry uh, Edic Cell paper. So, let us take a look at the, at the questions and discuss the answers. A series of tests is carried out on a solid compound A and an aqueous solution B. And he's saying compound A contains one cation and one anion. Just as a reminder, cations are the positive ion, anions are the negative. Complete the inferences. First, he says a flame test is carried out on A, and he got a yellow flame. Now, remember, you're required to know the flame test, and you're required to know these colors for these ions. So which one gives a yellow flame? You should know that the one that gives a yellow flame is the sodium ion. Now he's saying write the formula of the cation. So you cannot write it in words. And you have to remember that this is an A+, not just an A. It is not sodium metal. It is sodium ion, which has one positive charge. A small amount of solid A is placed in a test tube and heated strongly. And he says a glowing splint is held in the mouth of the test tube and the glowing splint relights. This is a test for what? Remember, if I insert a glowing splint and it relights, then this is a test for oxygen gas. Now, that means that the formula of the anion is what? What did he do? He heated a solid strongly. It gave oxygen gas. Which solid can I heat strongly and give oxygen gas? Remember that if it were something like, let's say, carbonate, it will give carbon dioxide gas. The ones that give oxygen gas are the nitrates of group one or actually any other group. So the nitrate of group one would give only a gas that relights glowing splint. Remember that the nitrates of other uh, metals would also give oxygen gas, but in addition to that, it will give nitrogen dioxide gas, which is a reddish brown gas. So when we heat a solid strongly and it gives a gas that relights a glowing splint, it is probably a nitrate. Again, he wants the formula of the anion. The formula here is NO3 minus. We have one minus charge on the nitrate uh, group. Okay, then he says a series of tests is carried out on aqueous solution B. He says a piece of magnesium ribbon is added to 5 centimeter cubed of B in a test tube. A lighted splint is held over the mouth of the test tube. We get bubbles of gas, and the gas burns with a squeaky pop. Which gas, if I put in a lighted splint, it gives a squeaky pop? That is hydrogen gas. Now, what does that tell me? If I put magnesium ribbon in something, and it gives out hydrogen gas, then that solution should be what? Magnesium reacts, magnesium is a metal. It reacts with what to give hydrogen gas? It reacts with acid. So magnesium, you put it in an acid, it gives the salt, whatever that should be, plus bubbles of hydrogen gas. So that means that the cation in B is the H plus ion. If I'm talking about an acid, then the cation is an H plus ion. I. Again, he wants the formula. Then he says silver nitrate solution is acidified with dilute nitric acid. Uh, and then uh, dilute nitric acid is added to another 5 centimeter cubed of B. And he got a white precipitate. Now, you should remember that silver nitrate with what would give a white precipitate? Silver nitrate is test for halide chloride, bromide, iodide. If I get a white precipitate, that means I have a chloride because it will form silver chloride. 
So the formula of the precipitate that forms is silver chloride. And that means that I have what? I have H plus ions in the previous test. And I found that I have something that has chloride. And that means the formula of my solution is HCl. It is the acid that has chloride. So solution B is HCl, hydrochloric acid. The second question says tests are carried out to identify three organic liquids. A spatula measure of phosphorus chloride, PCL5, is added to each liquid in separate test tubes, and any gas given off is tested with damp blue litmus paper. Okay, let us remind ourselves first, PCL5 is test for what? That's the first thing you ask yourself in any of these questions. Well, you should know that PCL5 is something that would react with an alcohol or with an acid because it replaces the OH part of that compound with a Cl. So if you react a PCL, PCL5 with an alcohol, it gives you the chloroalkane. If you react it with an acid, it will give the compound in which the OH is replaced by Cl. Now, what are the other products? The other products are POCl3 plus HCl, which comes out in the form of white fumes. So hydrogen chloride gas comes out in the form of white fumes. So what are the misty fumes? These are HCl. Now, which ones gave us misty fumes? Remember, C gave misty fumes and the damp blue litmus paper turned red. Of course, if you put litmus paper in HCl, HCl is an acidic uh, solution if it is in the form of a solution. Now, D also gave me misty fumes, but E did not. So remember that now what we know is E is not an alcohol and it is not an acid. Then he says two centimeter cubed of sodium carbonate is added to each liquid. And he found that C gives him bubbles of gas that lime water, in which lime water turns milky. So if I add carbonate to something and it gives gas that turns lime water milky, and I'm supposed to identify the gas, which gas turns lime water milky? Carbon dioxide gas. That tells me that C is what? C is an acid. Carbonates react with acids to give carbon dioxide gas that turns lime water milky. So this tells me that C is an acid. The others are not. Okay, then he says each of the compounds contains three carbon atoms and one functional group which is on the end of the chain. Using this information and the results from parts A and B, what do you think is the structure of C and D? Well, we have already deduced that C should be an acid. It is an acid that has three carbons, so it should look like this. What about D? Well, D, we said, it reacts with the PCL5, but it did not react with the carbonate. And that means that it's an alcohol. So this is an alcohol with three carbon atoms. And he says that the functional group is at the end, so it has to be one propanol. Then the mass spectrum of E has a molecular iron peak at 58. Remember, he said it has three carbons. And when we reacted with PCL5, it did not react. When we reacted with the carbonate, it did not react. And then it has a, a molecular mass of 58. You will find that it should be an aldehyde. The aldehyde here does not react with PCL5, does not react with carbonate, and if we calculate the MR of this, it will come out to be 58. Give a chemical test and its positive result to confirm the identity of the functional group in E. So we are saying that E should be an aldehyde. What is the test for aldehyde? Well, you should know that we have actually two tests, or at least two tests for aldehyde. You can say add Benedict solution. Remember that Benedict solution will react only with aldehydes, not with ketones or uh, alcohols or acids. 
So if you add Benedict's solution to an aldehyde, it gives a red precipitate. Okay, the apparatus shown was used to find the enthalpy change of combustion of one of these liquids. List all the measurements you would make in carrying out this experiment. So if we do this experiment to get enthalpy change of combustion, what should we be measuring? Well, you should know that first of all, we should measure the amount of water that we have there. So we should measure the volume of water. We should take the initial temperature of the water and then measure the temperature at the end. We should take the initial mass of the spirit burner and the uh, liquid inside at the beginning and at the end. So we need to measure initial mass of spirit burner. Then he says, give two ways, other than changing the measuring instruments or repeating the experiment in which the accuracy of the results could be improved. Remember, when we're trying to um, make an experiment to get delta H, well, what should we do to ensure the accuracy of our results? One of the things that you should do is we said we should surround the apparatus with a shield to prevent loss of heat to the environment or to uh, minimize the loss of heat to the environment. And he did the experiment in a beaker, and we really should not do it in a beaker. We should do it in a copper can because the copper can is a better conductor of heat. So usually when we do these experiments, we should add a shield around the apparatus, and we should use a copper can instead of the glass beaker. Then in this experiment, he says an experiment is carried out to determine the formula of an oxide of copper. A sample of copper oxide is reduced to copper by hydrogen gas. So he's passing hydrogen gas over copper oxide in order to reduce it. So weigh the empty test tube, place two spatula measures of copper oxide in the test tube and re-weigh. Pass hydrogen into the test tube and after a few seconds, light the gas at the hole at the end of the test tube. Of course, this is to remove any excess hydrogen that has passed through the apparatus and we did not use it. Start heating the copper oxide. After the copper oxide has been completely reduced, turn off the Bunsen burner, but continue to pass hydrogen over the product until it has cooled down. This is, of course, to prevent the reoxidation of the uh, copper. Weigh the test tube and the copper at the end. So the first thing he says, give a reason why in step three, there should be a delay of a few seconds before lighting the hydrogen at the end of the test tube. He said, I'm going to pass hydrogen from one end. And then after a few minutes or a few seconds, actually, he should light the end of the tube to remove the excess hydrogen. So why do we wait for some time? Well, we're trying to make sure that all the gas has been removed from the test tube and that hydrogen has spilled the tube. Then he says complete the table of results. So what does he have? He has the mass of the test tube, the mass of test tube and copper oxide. So if I want the mass of copper in the copper oxide, he has mass of test tube and copper. He has the mass of test tube. So actually if I do 42.79 minus 40.27, then I should get 2.52, which is the mass of copper. Now, how do we get the mass of oxygen? The mass of oxygen is the second and third reading that he has, the mass of test tube and copper oxide, minus the mass of test tube and copper. So the difference between 43.42 and 42.79, that would give me 0.63, which is the mass of oxygen in the copper oxide. Use these results to calculate the formula of this copper oxide. Okay, we have a certain uh, mass for copper and a certain mass for oxygen. Remember, to get the formula, we said we go through two main steps. Divide first by the MR of each one or the mass number of each one in order to get the number of moles. And then the numbers that come out, we divide by the smallest in order to have a simple ratio between the elements so this comes out one to one that means that my formula is cuo then he says the experiment was repeated uh, 
However, in step five, both the Bunsen burner and the hydrogen supply were turned off while the apparatus cooled. So he closed the Bunsen burner and he stopped the hydrogen during the cooling. He did not allow the apparatus to cool. Now state how the appearance of the solid in the test tube changes as the apparatus cooled. Of course, if you stop the hydrogen supply, that means oxygen will reach the copper. So it will return again from copper to copper oxide. So it will change from red to black. Now, explain how this change in the procedure affects the calculated formula of the copper oxide. So that means that the amount of copper that we're going to actually uh, measure at the end will be not correct. The mass of oxygen used will not be correct. So there will be less mass of oxygen calculated since some of the copper was reoxidized. An experiment is carried out to determine the molar mass of a solid acid H2X. Describe how 250 centimeter cube of a standard solution should be prepared using a pre-weight sample of 1.13 grams of the salt. So we have the solid, and the first thing we're trying to do is prepare 250 centimeter cube of a standard solution. Standard solution, I'm going to remind you, is a solution in which I know the exact concentration. Now, how do we prepare it? We say, He already says that he's going to weigh. So this is pre-weight sample of 1.13 grams of the salt. So he weighed it, of course, using a balance. And then, and then I'm going to take this, put it into a beaker, add some water, stir, so that I'm trying to dissolve the solid in distilled water. Then I start transferring this uh, solution into a volumetric flask. Now, how do we transfer a solution to a volumetric flask? We have to transfer it carefully. We pour the solution using a funnel into the volumetric flask. And then we wash the uh, beaker and put it into the volumetric flask. Then in this case, I have transferred everything into the volumetric flask. Now I add water to the volumetric flask, distilled water, of course, uh, or what we call pure water or deionized water, to the mark in the volumetric flask slowly until the bottom of the meniscus is at the mark. Then we close with the stopper, shake, invert several times in order to mix the solution so that all the solution has the correct concentration. Then he says 25 centimeter cubed of this solution was pipetted into a conical flask titrated with this concentration of sodium hydroxide. The indicator used was phenolphthalein. stayed the color change. Okay, what did he have in the flask? He had H2X, which is an acid. So if I put Phenolphthalein, I'm starting with acid, so it will start colorless. And then the problem with phenolphthalein is that at neutral, it's also colorless. So I need to put until the first drop turns from colorless to pink, that is my end point. Now, these are his readings. Using appropriate titrations, calculate the mean title. Now, he has a final reading, initial reading, and the difference between them is the volume of sodium hydroxide used. Now, which of these experiments should I use to calculate the mean or to calculate the average? Remember that we said the readings have to be concordant. Concordant means they have to be within 0.2 of each other. The difference between them should not be more than 0.2. So which of these are concordant? You should realize that experiment two and experiment three are the ones that are concordant so these are the ones that i will use to calculate the mean type then he says calculate the number of moles in 250 centimeter cube so you need to calculate the number of moles first of sodium hydroxide so from that uh, mean title that i have which is the volume i can calculate number of moles of sodium hydroxide this is concentration times volume, so that gives me a certain number of moles. Then I relate that to the number of moles of 
H2x in 25 centimeter cubed, you will find from the equation, where was the equation? The equation was somewhere here. The um, H2x reacts with twice the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. So I, if I have the number of moles of sodium hydroxide, then the number of moles of H2S is half of that. And then from that number of moles, I can get the number of moles in all the 250. Remember that this is the number of moles in the titration. I was using only 25 for the titration. Now, the number of moles in the whole 250 centimeter cubed will be that number multiplied by 10. So that gives me the total number of moles of H2X in the 250. Then he says, calculate the molar mass of H2X using your answer and the mass of H2X given because I have mass and I have number of moles so I can, I can get the molar mass. The molar mass would be mass over number of moles. So that tells me that the molar mass of the H2X is 89.9. The maximum uncertainty each time a burette is read is 0.05. Calculate the percentage uncertainty in measuring this volume of sodium hydroxide. Remember that we said when I use a burette, you need to take the reading twice. You read it at the beginning, the initial reading, and you read it at the end of the titration, and then you subtract them. So you're actually uh, taking the reading twice. Now he's telling me, and you should know this is uh, standard, that every time you take a reading from a burette, it is within 0.05 centimeter cubed on its accuracy. So the percentage uncertainty, if I'm measuring 11.7, we said, how do we get the percentage uncertainty? It is the 0.05 times two, because I'm going to read it twice, over the volume that I'm reading times 100. This is how you get percentage uncertainty. Two times 0.05 over your reading times 100. The percentage uncertainties in the three titrations are similar. So just how the percentage uncertainty in a burette measurement could be reduced without changing the apparatus. So how do I get a more accurate reading or something with less uncertainty? Remember that the bigger the numbers that we use, so if I use a more dilute solution of sodium hydroxide, then my titer will be higher. Or if I use a greater mass of the acid, then my titer will be higher. And when the titration reading is higher, then the percent error becomes less. Limonene, an oil, can be extracted from oranges in four steps. And he's saying in step one, grated orange peel is added to some distilled water. The mixture is heated under reflux. So he is... Uh, trying to get limonene from orange. The first thing he's going to get orange peel and he's going to heat it under reflux. Draw a label diagram of the apparatus used to heat something under reflux. Remember, this is how you heat something under reflux. You have the orange peel and water and you have the condenser vertical on the flask and you should realize that the water still goes in from the down or from the bottom and goes out from the top. In step two, the mixture from step one is distilled. The distillate contains a mixture of limonene and water. Now, in step three, limonene and water mixture is poured into a separating funnel and pentane is added. Limonene is much more soluble in pentane than in water. So he's trying to dissolve the limonene in pentane and get it out of the water mixture. And he's telling me that the density of pentane is this. Do we know the density of water? You should know that the density of water is 1. So if he says that the density of pentane is 0.6 something, that means pentane is, has lower density, and that means it will float on the water layer. So if we have this, then the pentane will be the upper layer, and the water or the aqueous layer will be at the bottom. He's saying complete the diagram by drawing the aqueous and pentane layers and labeling them. So pentane has lower density than water, so its layer will uh, float on top of the water.
Describe how the separating funnel is used to obtain the pentane layer. Now, when we use the separating funnel, how do we use it? You should know that when we put things into the separating funnel, what we do is we need to shape and invert the funnel several times. Then we open the cover to release the pressure because when you shake it several times, there will build up a pressure from the gas bubbles in there. You open the cover to release the pressure. Then we leave it to settle so that it forms the two layers and then open the tab slowly to release the lower aqueous layer into container, then close the tab, and then I will release the pentane layer that is remaining in the flask into a separate, uh, in the funnel, into a separate container. In step four, the pentane is allowed to evaporate in a fume cupboard, leaving limonene. 150 milligrams of limonene is produced from 23 grams of orange pit. Calculate the percentage of limonene by mass that is extracted from the orange peel. Okay, so I got 150 milligrams from 23 grams of orange peel. So remember that if you're doing it, the one up and down has to be the same units. So you can either use both of them in milligrams or both of them in grams. Of course, we change the milligram to gram, so we multiply that by 10 to the minus 3 over the mass of the orange peel times 100. This comes out to be 0.65%. Then he says 0.001 mole of limonene decolorizes 0.32 grams of bromine water. Remember, bromine uh, reacts with something that is an alkene, and limonene from its name implies that it is an alkene that has double bonds. Now explain what these results tell you about the structure of limonene. Okay, he's saying if I have 0.01 mole of limonene, it will decolorize 0.32 grams of bromine. You can use this information to determine how many double bonds do we have in limonene. Because I can get the number of moles of bromine so that is mass over molecular mass of the bromine. And that means that I have 0.002 mole of bromine. And that means that this number of moles of limonene reacted with this number of moles of bromine. So one mole will react with how much? Cross multiplication or you just divide. And that means that if I have one mole of limonene, it will react with two moles of bromine. Remember that each double bond needs one mole of Br2 because when I react uh, an alkene uh, the, with Br2, it opens up and I put Br and Br. It's an addition reaction. So one mole of limonene reacts with two moles of bromine. That means that the limonene had how many double bonds? Each double bond needs one mole. So if I needed two moles, that means I have two carbon carbon double bond okay and that's the end of the paper thank you for listening i hope this was useful